it wasn't good, at least not yet. You see, in our world today, when someone says something is not good, oftentimes it's kind of a joke, it's ironic, it's an understatement. Because what is there in our life that couldn't use some improving? But in Genesis 2, do you remember the story? How God creates all matter, and how he sits down day after day, and he forms and fashions the world in which we live. He makes the light and the dark. He makes the atmosphere and the universe. He makes the dry ground and the seas, the birds overhead, the fish in the sea, the animals all around. And as God forms and fashions it, do you remember what he says time after time? It was good. 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 I mean, he says it so much, it almost seems silly to keep repeating it. Until you get to Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, if you remember, God focuses in on his crown of his creation, which is human beings. And he tells us how he sits down and he forms Adam from the dust of the earth and he breathes life into his nostrils, taking more care of Adam than anything else in all of creation, except for maybe one. Talks about how he makes a garden for him, gives him a job. It was a perfect place. And then God says something for the first time in all of Scripture, in all of human history. The Lord God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Do you see what he said? It's not good. And what is it exactly that wasn't good? I mean, there's no war, there are no sicknesses, there's no disease. There are no economic problems. There are no politics. None of the problems that so often dominate are headlines. The world was perfectly balanced. Everything was in pristine condition. He lived in a perfect place, in a perfect garden. But he lived there alone. That's not good. You know, it's funny. Almost everything in Genesis 1 and 2, our world will laugh at the idea that God created the heavens and the earth with the power of his word, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam naming the animals. But this part, this part they agree with. It's not good to be alone. In fact, it's been called an epidemic. Last fall, CNN did a story on a survey that, that reportedly surveyed 77% of the world's population, and the subject was loneliness. Do you know what they found? One in four people on the planet report feeling alone. And the younger you get, the worse it gets. The highest rates of loneliness were in people from the ages of 19 to 29. Another survey surveyed college students. It said a whopping 60% of them feel isolated. 60% as they live on campuses in dorms surrounded by people, in classes surrounded by their peers, and yet somehow still alone. Like I said, there's almost nothing in Genesis 1 and 2 much of our world would agree with, but this part they agree with. It's not good to be alone. It's been called an epidemic. The World Health Organization has weighed in. The Surgeon General has weighed in. All kinds of studies have been done to show the devastating effects of loneliness. Isn't that funny? I mean, just think of all the advancements in our culture. All the ways you can be connected to people. If you want to see someone face to face, you can get on a plane and you can go there inside a day usually and see them. And if you just want to talk to them face to face, you can use FaceTime on your phone. You just want to hear their voice, you can call them. If you want to, you can enter their address into Google Maps. You can zoom in and you can see their car in the driveway right here in the pews today. With social media and telephones and all of our technology, it's never been easier to be connected, and yet somehow, we've never felt more alone. And that's not good. And God has just the thing. But he's got to do it right. You see, if God were a tyrant, he would just have taken Adam and Eve, put them together, and said, figure it out, be nice but he's not a tyrant. 
He's a God who loves you more than anyone else in your life. And that means he wants you to love him and he wants you to love each other. And so this is what he has Adam do. It says, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. God doesn't command Adam to do anything. He just brings him the animals. He prays him in front of him, and Adam does what he was created to do. He takes care of the creation God had put under him. And as he's naming them and categorizing and seeing all the different forms of life God had created, he notices something. There was no one suitable. It's not that there wasn't life. Life was everywhere. God said, let there be, and it's like life just shot from his fingertips in so many ways. I mean, there were birds overhead, there were fish in the sea, there were lizards on the ground, there were animals prating in front of him. The problem is, they weren't suitable. Do you know what that word means literally? It means there was no helper against him. Someone that you could bounce ideas off of, get some feedback from. Someone who's against you in all the right ways. We call that a counterpart. You see, Adam didn't need a hobby. He didn't need a therapy dog. He needed a counterpart. He needed a helper against him. And so God brings Eve into the world. And in so many ways, it's the grand finale of his creation. Look look what he says. So the Lord God caused a man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. It's the grand finale of his creation. And notice it's not the creation of the Rocky Mountains or the crystal clear blue seas of the Caribbean or the perfect sunset, but the grand finale, the missing piece, is Eve. You know, if God made Adam special by making him first, he makes Eve special by setting the stage for her arrival. And if Eve is a missing piece, then their union is the cherry on top. Because that union of a husband and a wife provides such a unique form of companionship. A relationship in which two become one. A relationship in which people have an opportunity to be helpers against each other in all the right ways. To share life with each other, each other's highs, each other's lows, their joys and their fears. To bounce ideas off of one another and get feedback from one another. It's one of the greatest relationships God has given us. And the sexual union is an expression of that. An expression of the reality that two have become one and the life God brings from it. Kids and grandkids and siblings and nieces and nephews, even the neighbor kids, they all come from that. God has blessed us through this gift in so many ways. And so God brings Eve to Adam. They're united in marriage. And now, now it's good. And God protects what is good. We've seen how every commandment protects something, some good gift of God. In the sixth commandment, God is protecting his gift of marriage and family and everything that goes along with that. Protecting that union between a man and a woman where two become one. And all the blessings that are yours to have a counterpart, someone to share your life with. Protecting that sexual union between a man or a woman, an expression of the reality of two becoming one. 
to protect the life that comes from that, the kids and the grandkids, the families into which you're born, your siblings and your cousins and your nieces and your nephews, all those amazing relationships that are yours. He protects here. Because in one way or another, we have all benefited from this gift. It doesn't matter who you are. Some of you through your own marriages and your own kids. Some of you through the families into which you were born, your relationships with your siblings or your cousins. Some of you just with the fact that the more stable families are out there, the more stable our culture and society becomes. But all of us benefit. And all of us have made a mess out of it. You see, God was right. It's not good for the man to be alone. The devil agrees with that too. That's what he loves about it. You see, alone is where he wants us. Isolated from each other, isolated from God because he knows that then we don't stand a chance. So it shouldn't surprise us that he spent a lot of time and effort trying to destroy this gift. And for this one, I don't think I need to throw stats at you. You've seen it. Our family deserves the best of us. They rely on us more than anyone else in our lives, and yet so often they get our worst. I mean, honestly, if you spoke to your coworkers like you speak to your spouse, how many of us would get fired? If we treated the kids on our little league team the way we treat our kids sometimes, how many of us would get kicked out of the league? If you and I spoke to our neighbor the way we speak to our parents or our siblings or our family members, how many of our neighbors would never speak to us again? Our families depend on us more than anyone, and yet so often our families get the worst of us. And yeah, that leads to loneliness. And the devil is always there waiting with all the wrong alternatives. Ways he tells you you can find a way not to be alone, but ways that in the end he knows are only going to make you more and more alone. And so he takes that intimacy between a man and a woman in marriage, that sexual bond, and removes it from marriage and takes away all the parameters and tells you you can do anything you want to do in whatever way you want to do, as often as you want to do it, as long as you like it. And that there are no consequences. But it's a lie. Consequences are everywhere. And he knows that as we chase intimacy in that way, we only get more and more guilty and ashamed and alone. He tells us what we need in a marriage isn't a counterpart. You need someone who's going to meet your needs, make you feel happy, give you what you need to get. And if they can't do that, to just go and find someone else. And he watches as her families are torn apart. And our poor kids. He'll convince us sometimes to put them up here on a pedestal, to make them into idols so they get a level of entitlement that no one in their life is ever going to agree to. Or he'll convince us to believe they're distractions that pull us away from what we really want to be doing in life. Either way, it leaves them alone too. Because he knows It's not good for the man to be alone. It's what he loves about it. It was a cherry on top of all of creation. I mean, the whole creation account builds towards this. Adam and Eve are brought together, and look what it says. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. No shame, no guilt, no regret, no fear, no fighting. When's the last time you could say that about your relationships? And it was just wrecked. Do you remember the story? In the very next verse, the devil approaches Adam and Eve at the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the devil convinces them to do what God commanded them not to do, to eat from that tree. And when they do that, everything is destroyed. This perfect world, their perfect lives, and their perfect marriage shattered. Do you remember what God found when he went to look for him? Two people lying and accusing and blaming and hiding and afraid. Now that sounds familiar. 
you remember how God dealt with them? He could have come in there, fuming mad, storming in. But he doesn't do that, does he? He comes quietly. And he comes and he finds people that are lying and blaming and accusing and afraid and ashamed. And so he gives them, of all things, a promise. A promise that someone is going to come who's going to put it back. And that one comes through Eve. Through this thing they had made a mess out of, God was going to create a family line of the Savior. A family line with conniving husbands and, and awful wives and terrible people. Stories like we just read about with the story of David and Bathsheba. He is in the family line of the Savior. Until the time came when God took on human flesh and entered this world. So he could give you what you need as we come face to face with this command. You see, I don't think there's any commandment that fills us with more shame and more regret than this one. Because like we said, our families deserve the best of us, and so often they get the worst of us. And when we replay our mistakes in our heads, how many times are these the scenes that play before us? But God gives us exactly what we need. Not a time machine to go back and do it over, because if he did that, we'd just screw something else up, something better. He gives you forgiveness. He wipes the sake clean. He assures you that because Jesus came, that he lived and he died and he rose, that he kept God's law perfectly in your place, that he's taken away your offense, that God isn't mad at you, even if you're mad at you and everyone in your life is mad at you. He is not. And there's amazing power in that to move forward. To move forward not in the life you would have had had you not made a mess out of it. That's not the life you have. But to move forward in the life that's in front of you. With all the shattered remnants of relationships that we've destroyed because of our own sinful selfishness. And yet an opportunity to move forward in forgiveness. An opportunity for broken families to move forward in forgiveness. To show God's love to each other in the way in which they live, in spite of their circumstances. An opportunity for people living in the wake of a failed relationship to move forward in forgiveness, to forgive themselves, to forgive the other, and to move forward knowing that they have an opportunity right here, right now, to serve God in the life in front of them. An opportunity in complicated families where this person can't talk to that person and all these problems are in the background with all of our baggage to salvage what we can salvage, to forgive what we can forgive, and to move forward. Because it's not good for man to be alone. Even the devil agrees with that. That's what he loves about it. But in Jesus, you're not. Because Jesus came, because he lived, died, and rose, because he's taken your sin away, he is always with you. You were never alone. But he's done more than that. He's given you so many people. In spite of all of our failings and all of our mistakes, he's given us our spouses and our kids and our grandkids and our cousins and our siblings and our parents and our aunts and our uncles and a whole community of Christians. You see, it's not good for a man to be alone. And because of Jesus, you never are. Amen.